Here again is Potholder's first law. Myths are created much faster than they can be debunked. So when I received a message containing yet another triumphant proof that we don't need to be concerned about CO2, I knew it would be at least a couple of months before I could get around to doing a video on it. But since the story in a blog called The Register included a detailed source, and since the mistakes were so obvious, I decided I had time to do a quick debunk. First, here's the myth. It now appears that the previous current state of climate science may simply have been wrong, and that there's really no need to get in an immediate flap. We can go a couple of centuries without any dangerous warming. But who says so? Apparently someone called Lewis Page, who, according to this bio, is an expert in military history. So how does he know we won't experience dangerous warming for another two centuries? And if the climate change issue is thus resolved, why isn't this headline news all over the world? It could be because there's a secret plot by the media to keep us from the truth. Page cites real researchers at NASA and a real study and a real explanation. So where does he go wrong? Let's start with the study. There are a number of things that tend to enhance global warming due to CO2. This is called positive feedback. And a number of things that tend to reduce global warming due to CO2, called negative feedback. Among the negatives is evapotranspiration in plants, which tends to cool the air around them. There's still a lot of uncertainty about how much evapotranspiration there'll be, but NASA researchers made an estimate and plugged that into a model. So far, no problem. But then Page and Reality part company. He says the NASA study shows that when evapotranspiration is taken into account, a doubling of CO2 levels would cause the Earth to warm by just 1.64 degrees. So he concludes that all the other models, which don't take evapotranspiration into account and show much higher amounts of warming, are therefore wrong. Page seems to think the study consists of just one model which includes evapotranspiration, but it doesn't. The researchers clearly state in their paper that they made three models. The first was a control climate model that did not take evapotranspiration into account, and it suggested that a doubling of carbon dioxide would lead to a warming of around 1.94 degrees centigrade. This wasn't the important part of the paper, this was just a base to work from, because what they really wanted to find out was how much this figure rose and fell as other factors were included. In the third model, they plugged in evapotranspiration and found a warming of 1.68 degrees. So their conclusion was, and this is what they were after, that evapotranspiration reduced warming by 0.26 degrees centigrade. There's nothing to suggest that the control model is any more or less correct than all the other models that have been produced. As the authors themselves pointed out, 1.94 degrees is at the low end of a range of results from other computer models which vary from 2 degrees to 4.5 degrees. If we deduct the cooling effect of evapotranspiration from the high end of the range mentioned in the paper, we get warming of around 4.24 degrees. So even when evapotranspiration is included, most models still project temperature increases that are not that different and are a cause for concern. So while Page tells us we no longer have a problem with CO2 concentrations, the researchers who actually wrote the paper came to a completely different conclusion. Bournoa stressed that while the model's results show a negative feedback, it is not a strong enough response to alter the global warming trend that is expected. This feedback slows but does not alleviate the projected warming, Bunoa said. But that still doesn't explain why Page thought the warming would be 1.64 degrees when the researchers said it would be 1.68. It's a small difference, but it tells a bigger story. It tells us that Page didn't read the paper at all. He only read NASA's press release. Because the press release didn't include the researchers' figure of 1.68 degrees. It gave the correct result of the control, 1.94 degrees, but when it gave the figure for the cooling effect of evapotranspiration, it rounded it up to 0.3 degrees. Page was obviously working with the figures from the press release, because when he subtracted one from the other, he got 1.64. Okay, so that explains the spurious temperature projection, but what about the two centuries Page says it'll take to get there? Page gives no source for this, but it's easy to see how he figured this out on his own. He read in the press release that the researchers based their model on a doubling of CO2 concentration, so he doubled today's accepted figure of 390 parts per million and came up with 780 parts per million. 
Next, he needed a growth rate for CO2 being pumped into the atmosphere, two parts per million per year. Divide 390 by 2, and you get 195 years, which is roughly a couple of centuries. No wonder people complain about the millions of dollars spent on scientific research when all you need is five minutes and a pocket calculator. It was beautifully worked out and wonderfully wrong. First, Page's assertion that a doubling of CO2 meant 780 parts per million was a good guess, but if he'd checked the paper, he would have seen that the model was based on a concentration of 700 parts per million, not 780. That's another 310 parts per million more than today, not 390. So at the assumed growth rate of 2 parts per million per year, it would take 155 years to reach this figure, not 195. As for the growth rate itself, Page gives us a source, the Mauna Loa monitoring station in Hawaii. But this is only the current growth rate of CO2 emissions. Page assumes the growth rate won't increase, and more importantly, that the land and oceans will continue to absorb carbon dioxide at the same rate. Unfortunately, that absorption rate is already declining. A 2009 study by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology found that without curbs, CO2 concentrations are likely to reach between 716 and 1,095 parts per million by 2095, just 85 years away, not 155 or 195. Inevitably, Page's story was copied and pasted in blogs all over the internet and attracted comments from people who were so unskeptical they believed it without bothering to check either the abstract of the paper or the accompanying news release on NASA's website. And this one is my personal favourite. The blogger took Page's unsourced opinion that global warming won't be a problem for another 200 years and attributed it to scientists from NASA. Wait, what is right? Look, I understand we can't spend our days checking every bit of information that comes our way, and we may not even have the expertise to do that. But if a piece of information makes you go, wait, what? and seems to run counter to prevailing science, and isn't being reported by the quality media, it can't hurt to check the source. People who copy and paste this stuff on their own blogs have an even greater duty to check its veracity. Remember, the opposite of sceptical is gullible. But after wading through all the blunders and the bullshit, the NASA study is important. The warming effect of carbon dioxide is well understood because it's basic physics. Even skeptics, I mean real skeptics who are actual climate scientists, accept that carbon dioxide causes warming and even agree on how much warming. Where more research needs to be done is the question of sensitivity, and that's why positive and negative feedbacks are being quantified. The idea that evapotranspiration is one of these feedback systems is not a new one, but the question is, how much of an effect will it have? Even NASA's model may have to be revised, because research that was published after NASA's model was put together shows that evapotranspiration rates are in fact declining, so the negative feedback may turn out to be a lot less. It's interesting that the Register chose to put a quote from Benoit at the top of the page article. Important to get these things right. Well, I couldn't agree more. Perhaps they should have taken that advice on board. Every week I see claims like this, that there's some new proof that climate change theory is all wrong and that scientists are now having to abandon the theory of climate change. Potholer's law holds true because it only takes 15 minutes to make up a myth and post it on a blog. But it usually takes days of painstaking work to try to track down where the myth comes from, read the relevant research papers, and write a detailed rebuttal complete with references. In this particular case, a debunk was very easy, because the source was right there, and anyone who's sceptical can see where Page went wrong. Even so, in the few hours it's taken me to put this debunk together, someone else could have invented five new myths that have already been posted. Inevitably, they're going to pop up faster than they can be whacked down.